Good morning, Bethel Church. Um, what a morning, hey. <laughs> um, I just want to start off by saying thank you so much for your support and your prayers um, and for giving financially. Uh, I'm standing here because of Jesus' call in my life and because of your support, because of your prayers, um, because you stood with me. So I just want to thank you for that. How do I begin to share all that God taught me on this mission to Zambia? If I were to say what happened to me in a few words, it would be, Jesus changed me. Um, as a child, I, I'm just going to kind of tell you a bit about how I got to this point. As a child, I would go to resorts with my family. We, we would see different people and we'd go on different excursions. And, and as we'd go, I, I would see the people on the outside, the poor people, and I would look and I'd be like, oh, you know, I want to know them. Like, what's their story? Who are they? Um, and so kind of around that time, I wanted to, I've always wanted to go on a mission. And it just didn't end up happening until, until this year. And uh, about six years ago, a friend of mine went on a mission trip to Africa through an organization called Hands at Work. And I, I went to her home. She shared about the people she met. And God just touched my heart. I was just, I, there was just something there. And I just thought, I have to be a part of this. So I took some photos home. I put them up on my fridge. And we started praying for them. And Katie taught me about uh, how Hands works. And what they do is they go um, to Africa and they work with the local Africans there and they help the most vulnerable. They help the widows and the orphans by giving them three essential services, food, education, and, um, and medical assistance. So that's how they work. And 100% of what is given goes directly on the ground to Africa. So that really, that really took my heart there. Um, another p major part of what they do is they go and visit the families and they get to know them and they pray for them and share Jesus' love with them. So God grew my heart. We started supporting financially as a family and praying for, these, for the people there. And then this year, God was calling me to become even more involved. And, and originally I thought, you know, I'll just give more money. But God was saying, no, you need, to, you need to invite more people a part of this. So I invited you as a church to, to join in. And now we've, we are serving and uh, we're giving to a community called Nisi. And, uh, and my friend Katie asked me this year, or last year, she said, would you ever consider going and visit? And I thought, no, 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 I'll just, I'll give money. That's, that's what I'll do. I'm not going to go visit. But God had other plans, and, and I was able to go. And God, God challenged me to be brave and step out on the water, leave my family, go to the other side of the world. And he opened my eyes to the kingdom of God in Africa. He, he changed me. And he showed me the crisis there, and he was showing me that I could be part of the solution. So I want to just um, tell you a little bit about this crisis. So um, the world is moving forward, but Africa is being left behind. Why? Conflict, poverty, and the HIV-AIDS pandemic have combined to trap many African communities in extreme vulnerability. While most of the world's previous, previously poorest nations are escaping poverty, extreme poverty across sub-Saharan Africa is at its peak and worsening. And the next slide will show you a, a map. This is the world poverty clock. By the end of 2030, Africa is projected to have 90% of the world's extreme poor. One of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030. Now you can see the light pink, it's kind of hard to see, it's just a little bit, is on track. Off track is the medium red, and then the dark red is off track, and extreme poverty is increasing. And you can see a huge portion of that is in Africa. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see these are the eight countries in which hands works, and extreme poverty is in rise in seven. If we see in Zambia, which is the middle red one, over 10 million people are living in extreme poverty, and that's 56% of the population. Now, to give you a contrast, um, the poverty level in Canada is 11%. So that's, that's a huge difference between the 56%. So there's a crisis. And Han's model, like I said, is to mobilize the local church there to help the orphans and widows in Africa. So I joined a team, you can see the picture next, um, of five others from Abbotsford, one woman from the States. And the role of our team wasn't going to 
you know, build buildings or anything like that. It was going to strengthen and encourage the people that are already there. Having had no teams in two years, we were all very excited to go and to love them. Now, I want to take you on a journey to the places I went and the people I met, just to give you a picture of how hands works. This video I'm just going to play show next shows you what it looks like. They have these care points that the kids come to and are fed. So we'll just show you this video. There's, she's explaining it. I don't know if the volume's up, but there you go. Houses. It was, um, the center was in a, a, this church here, and then the pastor saw that it would be better for them to have their own building, and so he gave them this land in which their care point, uh, the CBO, has built a lovely building, a cook area, and then an open area inside here where people can, uh, the children can come and eat, they can get their food from, there is a bit of a, that window there, and that will open, and then they will have sit in there and eat and then they go out and um, play. They do a lot go to school um, different times it seemed but and then they had uh, about 10 young ones, 0 to zero to 5. So that is Nisi feeding point A. So that just shows you a picture of what the building looks like and when we would drive there the kids um, and the care workers would come and greet us and this next video is just showing them uh, welcoming us. You can see the lady in the white hat is one of the care workers um, that takes care of the children and brings them meals and visits them. Um, this next slide will show the care workers that are there. They, these people, these men and women, they come and they're volunteers. They, they don't get paid to do this. They come and they take care of these children. And these, these people are mothers and grandmothers um, that have struggles of their own, but they are willing to be ha the hands and feet of Jesus. And it was such a blessing and a privilege to meet them and to, um, and to get to know them. The next picture we'll see. So here's some of the children eating. Um, they get this meal every day. Um, it's changed a little bit. We got to eat it with them. It was, it was really special. There's a hands worker um, just giving some water to a child. In the next picture, we'll see um, a young girl eating. And then um, there's a picture of a man named Jones. He's, giving, he's washing the children's hands. And after we would eat with the children, we would play games with them. And there's Jones playing a game with them. They're having lots of fun. Um, I'll be talking more about Jones um, in the next, um, at the end of the service, but he's got an amazing story. He actually was one of the children that grew up in the care point, and now he serves um, and loves these kids. And his life would be so different if Hans hadn't come in and um, supported him and shown Jesus love. Um, the next one we'll see is a video of the kids playing with, with Jones. Yeah, Jones just, um, he just really showed um, the joy of the Lord. It was such a privilege to get to know him. And um, in the next slide, we'll see uh, one of the gifts or one of the privileges that I was able to have was um, God had called me to bring a ukulele on the trip and to leave it there with the ministry. Um, so I actually wrote a song um, called For God So Love the World. And so I, when I got there, I started playing it and they all came around me and then all of a sudden, I was playing, and then I said, can you sing along? And they all started to sing along with me. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, wow. Like, um, it was a dream I'd had to come and share, you know, the love of music and the love of Jesus with these children. It was just, it just blew me away, and that was that moment right there. So that was really special. And I was able to leave the ukulele there with Jones and teach him some songs, and um, Sometimes I think we think in the West that we are bringing the kingdom to Africa or to other places, but really the kingdom of Africa is there. They, they are on, so on fire for Jesus, and um, 
there's just such a beautiful heart there. And I received such blessing and love. You know, with the hard year of COVID, I, you know, I had some very lonely moments and I just went and they just loved me. So, and one of the things was Jones actually taught me some of their songs in Bemba. So I just wanted to play a song for you that I learned. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. Takwaba umwaba nga yesu. Takwaba umwaba nga yesu. Takwaba umwaba nga yesu. Takwaba takwaba ye. Oh na yenda na yenda yenda konse konse na faya faya konse konse na shungu luka konse konse takwaba takwaba ye takwaba umwaba nga yesu takwaba umwaba nga yesu Takwaba umwaba nga yesu Takwaba takwaba ye Takwaba takwaba ye Yeah, so it was such a, a gift to be able to learn their language, and, um, and the kids just loved it. So in this next slide, um, we, I was able to share God's word with them, and that was such a blessing to them, too. Each of us, of us on the team was able to share God's word in different communities that we visited and just love the little ones. Um, and the next one I th is um, a time of worship that we had with them. I'll just show you a video. We didn't know what they were saying, but they were worshiping God, and it was beautiful to be a part of that. You can see the kids um, in the doorway watching them, and they started dancing too. <laughs> Yeah, so that was really special. Um, and then one of the, the greatest things that we were able to be a part of and witness was going on holy home visits. So after the children play and are fed, we go to um, the different kids' homes. We're split up into groups, and we were able to visit the children um, and their families and, and their homes. And the next slide here we'll see. This is a care worker named Imelda um, who took me on my first holy home visit, and that's us walking to one of the homes. In the next slide, we'll see um, a picture of the first home I went to. And I just want to share with you a reflection of that visit um, that I went on. Later on that day, I had my first holy home visit. We went to see three young boys aged seven, five, and three, which we'll show on the screen. We met them sitting outside their dirt home, the size of a small bathroom. The care worker Meldas told us they found these boys six months ago severe, severely malnourished. The boys are alone while their mother works during the day and she spends her money on alcohol, not returning till late at night. As I sat in the dirt beside the oldest boy, he drew pictures of a car in the ground and I had to hold back tears. I've never witnessed this kind of neglect and despair before. Having three children of my own is cut deep into my heart. That night I couldn't sleep as I kept thinking about those boys. Were they cold? Were they hungry? Yes, they received one meal each day because of hands, but what about other neglected children? In that moment, 
God was breaking my heart, but he was also bringing me back to life. He was showing me the, the deeper calling to love and serve the least of these. How someone could see this and then just walk away, I, I couldn't understand. Like the Samaritan who saw the beaten man as an invitation to love, in Luke 6, we are called to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. How can we expect these children to know and accept the love of Jesus unless we make that love tangible by feeding, clothing, and inviting them in? What I had witnessed was unimaginable to me. But a friend reminded me that these boys are not alone. God sees them. God loves them. He created them and he, he knows them. And that is the truth. These children are seen. They are valuable and God has a plan and a future for them. So that was my reflection. But sometimes it's hard to know where to start when you hear of such a great need. But I started small. I started praying for a few families on my fridge. And then God grew my heart. And you can be the hands and feet of Jesus too to these children by praying for them by giving of your resources with a generous heart. I challenge you to join me in fighting for these children by praying daily for them and by supporting Hands at Work. Right now, our church supports six children in Nisi, but there's 20 other children that don't have support. As a church, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could help those 20 children be supported with Jesus' love? It's $25 a month for one child, and 100% of that goes on the ground to Africa. Years ago, I put up pictures on my fridge and we started to pray for these families and that's how it began. We received updates and God grew our hearts. There's more I'll be sharing right after the service, um, but I would encourage you to pray and see if God is prompting you to become more involved and I'll, I'll be sharing more about that after. So thank you for letting me share. That was super. That was so, so good. So uh, Kirsten's going to be uh, sharing after the, uh, after the service. Kind of a, an informal time here for those of you who want to know more and uh, hear more of what she experienced. Uh, it, it's, it's moving. I know that some of you were moved. And... And it is moving, what's going on in our world with so many underprivileged kids, especially the kids. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that we as a church can be a part of, uh, a small part of what the solution is, of, of the caring piece that, that is so desperately needed. And so thank you, Kirsten. That was just amazing. And she left one of her ukuleles over there, and the kids are playing it right now, which is, which is super. So I'll make this real quick. You don't have to worry about uh, being here too long. I'll, I'll try to stay under, under 45 minutes here if I can. You know, I'm kidding. But I'd like to start this, this last little challenge with a rhetorical question. At least, at least for me, it's a rhetorical question. Wouldn't you think that after Jesus rose from the dead, that his words and it and his actions would have really been worth noting? Or wouldn't you think that the record that we have of Jesus' last days on this earth and, and what he had to say for us would be worth noting for us? I think we'd all say with a, with a resounding <clears throat> chorus, of course, of course. In Acts 2, one, uh, 2 and 3, Luke writes this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them <clears throat> and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Matthew records that on one occasion in Galilee, that's uh, in northern Israel where he began his earthly ministry, that he met with his disciples and he gave 
than what we refer to as the Great Commission. Now, we know what the Great Commandment is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul, your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. But this is the Great Commission. And here it goes. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I touched on some of this two weeks ago when we were studying Mark 7, when we talked about Jesus on, on mission. And I said at that time that the word go, in this context, for you grammar buffs, is a participle. It's conveying a continuous action that is already happening right now, but that also continues to happen. It's ongoing. Literally, the word here for go is travel. Travel. So what Jesus is saying here is as you're going along in life, as you're traveling through life, make disciples. Disciple. That's the verb, literally. The verb in this command is make disciples. Disciple. If there's anything I remember from my New Testament Greek course over 40 years ago is that there's a difference between a participle and a verb. What I'm saying is the Great Commission isn't a verbal command to go. And might have you, some of you have probably been shocked by that, that it's not a command to go. The command is to disciple. That's the command. Because you're already going. You're already traveling through life. It's not necessarily about going on a cross-cultural mission to evangelize, to help people, even though that's a great thing to do. And I wish many of you would do that. And many of you have done it. We've heard from Kerastin. It's just tremendously life-changing. Carrie and I have led countless short-term missions and we love it. And we love what it does to people. But it's not necessarily about that. Or being a global worker, although that, that's a great calling. We support a number of global workers. We have partners in mission, as Gary was telling us earlier this morning. I'm so persuaded that Jesus is saying to every one of us, while you're going through your daily routine, whatever that may be, disciple. Disciple. What that means is that every person who follows Jesus must be participating in the Great Commission without ever going anywhere, really. Just carrying on. Just carrying on in your daily life. Because we're already going. We're already traveling. We're already following Jesus. We're all going through life in our everyday stuff. Following Jesus, being obedient, that's the place where we do the Great Commission, which is to disciple. And many of you probably by this point are saying, okay, would you explain to us what that means? What does it mean to disciple? Well, discipling, as I understand it, is simply two words. It's influencing and modeling. Influencing and modeling. And we need to remember these words. That's really my message today. And I pray that we remember these words. Influencing. Influencing the people we're surrounded by. That God gives us in our reality. Modeling for them what it means to be a Jesus follower. Years ago, Youth for Christ did a, a national survey. They asked people, if there's a question, one question that you could ask a Christian, what would it be? The two top questions that came back were, and I hope you're ready for these questions, the two top questions of people across Canada, if they had the opportunity to ask a Christian something, they would ask one of these two questions, two top questions. I hear what you're saying, or can I watch you? 
Second question, if I don't accept your Jesus, will you still be my friend? Right here, we've got the cry of the world for us to be influencers, for us to be modelers. Jesus demonstrated what discipling looks like and and what it looks like to influence and, and to model people when he simply joined two guys who were traveling from Jerusalem to the little town of Emmaus, probably about 12 kilometers away, west of of Jerusalem. Jesus just kind of joined these guys walking along the road. It was the day he rose from the dead. And he asked them, so what are you guys talking about? What are you guys talking about? And it turned out they were talking about him. And he began to influence them with his words and and his whole demeanor. He asked a question. He let them talk. He pointed out a few things to them. And then, and then, when they stopped, they got to their destination, he modeled what accepting hospitality looked like. And then he modeled what blessing and thanksgiving to God looked like. Wow. Their eyes were opened. The Bible tells us. The story's in Luke 24. We don't have time to look at it all. I I mean, I I love to just study it together with you. There's so much to to find there. But do yourself a favor and, and, and read it sometime this week, Luke 24 or even today. But after this encounter with Jesus, after they recognized him and he disappeared... They hightailed it back to Jerusalem and and, and told the disciples what had happened. And while they're reporting, Jesus appears, and John records what he had to tell them, which I believe is of paramount importance. It ties in what discipling, the, the completeness of discipling, such an important component to influencing and modeling. Listen to what he said in John 20, 21 and 22. Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they received the Holy Spirit just like we do when we receive Jesus into our lives, when we invite Jesus to be our leader, our forgiver, our Lord, our Savior, when we receive him. But here's the question I have for you. What's more important? That you have the Holy Spirit or that he has you. You see, we as followers of Jesus, we all have the Holy Spirit. He takes up residence in our lives, but does he have us? The Holy Spirit has to have control of our lives. The question is, are we filled with the Holy Spirit? That's what Jesus was talking about in Acts 1 when he said to his followers, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Friends, as as followers of Jesus, we need to be filled with his power. And then listen to Jesus' very last words before he ascended to heaven. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, my disciples. Telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As we're traveling, as we're going practically for us here in Penticton, and if you're connected online, wherever your your reality is, what does this me coming into the cold months of winter what does this look like what's your what's your jerusalem i think we have a good idea of what the ends of the earth is our judea might be penticton and region or or somewhere else like like i said if you're watching online Our samaria could be further east or south or north but what about our jerusalem I believe that it's our everyday reality. It's where we live right now. Students, it's your schools. Stay-at-home moms and dads. Your 
your immediate community that you're surrounded by, restaurant workers and business owners and business people, <coughs> teachers, <coughs> excuse me, medical workers and tradespeople, salespersons, retirees. It means as we're going and whatever we're doing, wherever we're finding ourselves, we bring flavor. We bring salt. We're the salt of the earth. We bring to our present reality. We bring light into it. We contribute. We speak positively. We're attentive. As we're stopping by the, the drive through window at Starbucks or Timmy's or wherever, we notice the person at the window. They're just not a thing there. Not a statue. They're a person. We notice them. We're attentive. We don't use we don't use our evenings up watching uh, America's Got Idols with Dancing Stars barely surviving Netflix. You see, I got five shows in there, okay? <laughs> we give blood when we can. Uh, we take an evening class so we can meet new people. We invite friends and neighbors to come to our house as the restrictions settle down. We, we invite people to come to church with us. Goodness, folks, people see you going to church. They see you get in your car. They see you leave. Maybe some of you have never spoken about it. It's as easy as saying, I guess you notice Sunday mornings I get in my car and go to, to church. Do you ever wonder about that? Ah, it's so easy. Well, some people say, well, Ralph, you know the thing is, you're a natural conversationalist, and it's easy for you to do that. It's not so easy for me to, to do that. Well, maybe I talk too much. No amens. Especially not from my wife over there. It's, it's not about talking. It's a little talking, of course, but it's not only about talking. That's not what influencing is all about. Telling and, and talking is important. But we, we influence in ways other than talking. Helping, for instance, and when we model, that's very little talking. And I know that much of what I'm saying right now, for many of you, you're involved here already, you're involved in your city, you're involved in your church, your neighborhoods, you're discipling, you're influencing, you're modeling pe pe with, w w before people what you're doing. Uh, you're going with the power of the Holy Spirit. You know that. You know that. You're practicing it already. But not all of us are. And we need to learn. We need to learn. Oh, we just need to learn. To as we're walking through this life, as imperfect as we are, we need to learn that we are Jesus' hands and feet. We are him before people. It's been almost 40 years ago. What really got me early on in ministry. We were pastoring in a, in a fairly large church, one of the pastoral staff. And, and I was walking in the atrium one day and, and towards me came a mom with her little girl. And she walked up to me and she said, with her little girl, she said, oh, who's that? And the little girl looked up at me and she said, that's Jesus. <laughs> Guess what? That's what people, little kids might have to say about you. That's Jesus. Are you a representative of Jesus? Are you modeling his life? Are you influencing people for the kingdom of God? Well, that shook me up that day, and I thought, wow. If that's how people see me as Jesus, I need to shift a few things in my life. I need to change a few things in my life. Maybe I need to be a better representation. Could be that you're here today, and you're thinking, well, I don't know if I influence people for Jesus. I don't know if I even model what a Jesus follower looks like. Here's your challenge today. Let's pray.
Lord, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for the way it started. With no power, and we just we just sang worship to you unplugged. Thank you, Lord. I, I just want to thank you too for, for Kirsten and how she's modeling what a disciple looks like. How she's influencing, and I know that you used her to influence people here today for your kingdom. We all need a heart change. All the time, every day, we need a heart change. We know how imperfect we are, so help us with that. Lord, you're challenging us with your word too. And oh, how we need to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit because if we try it in the flesh, it just, we just fall flat on our faces. So teach us, Lord, what it means to get out of bed every morning and say, fill me with your spirit, Lord. Here I go to influence people for your kingdom to model what that looks like as a follower of Jesus. Teach us about that, Lord. Teach me about that every day. Thank you for our church, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in our city. Thank you, thank you, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. And Lord, as we're about to go out this week, I pray a blessing on all of us. May the blessing of the Lord rest on the people of God. This week, may you know his fullness. May you know his power. In Jesus' name, amen.